You know when you're playing a game and you get so immersed in it that time kind of flies by? Like the gameplay is so fluid and the story is just a joy to experience. You forget for a little while that you're playing a game sometimes. But then something catches your attention. Not a visual cue or a bit of dialogue, but a sound. Maybe it's a familiar melody or a curious harmony and you get pulled into the music for a little bit. You stop what you're doing in the game and listen for a moment and think, damn, this soundtrack is really good. It's those moments that define games with the soundtracks we love, with the music that catches our attention and stays in our memories long after we've stopped playing. They have us going back to YouTube to look up those sometimes elusive songs and scouring websites for the composer in their other works. But what is it that gives a soundtrack this depth and presence that makes us pause and actually enjoy the music rather than let it loop in the background unnoticed? A little of it comes from an individual's taste, and what one person may find interesting musically, another might brush off entirely. But you'd be surprised how much it can also be traced back to a composer's technique and style. And like with any technique, an example illustrates it best. Takes a Less, the 2018 game by Matty Thorson, which is a gem among indie platformers. The gameplay is fast-paced, highly demanding, and frustratingly difficult at times, a factors one might think would distract from the player's ability to appreciate the game's music. But the soundtrack of Celeste is hailed as a masterpiece all on its own, with praise given for its evocativeness and storytelling qualities. Celeste composer Lena Rain would go on to compose for games like Minecraft, Sackboy, and, well, would you look at that? It's the game we'll be talking about today, Chicory, Colorful Tale, the recently released puzzle adventure indie game where your protagonist is tasked with beautifying a world that has lost its color. Like Celeste, Chicory is a great example of a game whose music has presence. Now what do I mean by that? The best way to illustrate is with a counterexample. A music that does not have presence, that doesn't really capture the player's interest. Now there are a lot of factors here, genre and production value being incredibly important. Action games with big teams won't have the same opportunities for fine-tuning their music as will more simplistic games worked on by a smaller, more nimble team. In The Legend of Zelda, for example, there's a tendency in the earlier games to have very memorable dungeon themes. With the limited sound font and more simplistic gameplay, there's a strong motivation to make the music spunky and catchy. But after the jump to 3D, the dungeons typically feature more ambient themes that, while they're more realistic and good at setting the mood, aren't nearly as interesting from a musical standpoint. It kind of just blends into the background ambience, no? But on the other side of things, it's not just ambient and quiet versus loud and spunky. You can't just blast music at the player and expect it to catch their attention. Yeah, yeah, I'm calling out JRPG battle music. I don't care if it's a jamming piece, you can't just ignore the environment and types of enemies you're encountering. It just, it's just kind of funny how like this horrible, like that they never returned. And then a ghost with a skull face and a scythe. <laughs> it's the Greeper. And then it's like, <laughs> you're killing the spirit of a sailor who died. <laughs> nice. Obviously, Super Mario RPG is an older game, again, with limited music technology, but you get the point. Music with presence needs subtlety and skill. It needs structure, but also the ability to change. So let's talk about the music of Chicory. When you start up the game, the first thing you'll hear on the title screen is this wonderful little flourish that kind of catches you off guard. There are these monotone strings outlining the root of our key, while a piano and a harp outline, in a very impressionist way, some vague bits of melody. Already we're seeing some of the techniques that give this piece and the game's soundtrack their memorable qualities. 
These sparse notes kind of hang in a void of empty space, and they're so unpredictable and arrhythmic, they have a strong impact whenever you hear them. There's this sense of not knowing where these notes or this piece will take us, of the promise of things to come. If we read around long enough, perhaps we start doodling on the title screen here, we hear one of the game's many leitmotifs come out. Though let's wait a little bit to start dissecting it. You might also notice how close everything sounds to the microphone. I really don't know how you do this in recording technology other than just putting the mic literally on top of the strings or next to the flute. You can almost hear the reverberations of the strings themselves on the harp. And there are creaking and shifting sounds as hands move up and down the instruments. Like someone talking to your face versus far away, this closeness really grabs the player's attention and in a way it forces them to listen to the music. We'll definitely see more of this technique later. So let's dive into the music for the town of Luncheon, the main hub of the game and where a character resides. Take a listen. <laughs> So you can see this melodic pattern occurring through the first few bars. This lends to that sense of stability which we expect from a starting village or a homely town. But contrasting that simplicity are these really interesting harmonies, a lot of accidentals, a lot of expansive chords. Though the guitar is this simple arpeggio, it has a lot of nice activity going on that keeps things interesting. And to show this, let's hear it if the composer had gone for a simpler, more traditional harmonization of a 1-4-5 progression. It sounds alright, but it's missing something, right? And this sounds more like a happy-go-lucky village without any real troubles or history, while the original chords lend a feeling of weight and wistfulness to the music. Importantly, there's this E flat added to the seventh chord, which makes it far more interesting. Here's how it sounds without the added E flat. It just sounds more tame, less interesting, right? I love that the first main piece for this game is so harmonically complex and as varied as this. You might even say the theme for luncheon is uh, <laughs> unforgettable. Ah, Superintendent Chalmers, welcome. I hope you're prepared for an unforgettable luncheon. Like I hinted at earlier, motifs play a big role in the soundtrack. Progressions, harmonies, and even instruments make important recurrences to signify characters and common themes. I love how the go-to instrument for our main character is this recorder-like flute that's used in all of the discovery sound effects. <laughs> and some of the main cutscenes. Now let's talk about the motif. So sometimes I feel like recurring themes can be a crutch for composition. Like, cool, you're reusing existing musical elements, but you have to make sure you're actually doing something with them. And my favorite example of a lead motif gone wrong is from, of all games, Pac-Man World 2. Anyone who's played this knows what I mean. The main theme from the game is the basis for pretty much every single level, and it gets really annoying after a while. But tying this back into our discussion about musical presence, when used well, leitmotif can have a powerful effect on the listener that, like hearing your name from across a room, draws you into the music. 
You're probably not surprised to hear that Chicory does this extraordinarily well. Probably the best example to illustrate this is how the luncheon theme changes partway through the game and is reharmonized into a minor key. But wait, there's more to this song than just being a transposed version of what we heard before. Uh, first off, there's this bizarre D-flat chord, which does not belong here at all, but serves as a lead-in to the minor third, an E-flat minor chord. And the key is really ambiguous. It definitely starts in C minor, the relative minor of our E-flat major key, but changes subtly midway through. Ah, the D-flat acts as the major seventh of an E flat minor key. And see how the progression simplifies now? music has this pull to it that comes from its unexpected harmonization. We hear that first C minor chord rooted by this new string bass and think, uh oh, something has happened here. But that key change to E flat minor gives us pause and the music takes on a somewhat ambivalent feel as it flips between major and minor chords. It's as if we're holding our breath, waiting for something bad to happen, but the rest of the world keeps on going about its business. The title of this variation is Seeds of Doubt, and that is just perfect for how the player feels when they hear this song. Oh, and notice how the melody is identical to the original, note for note. Only the bass and harmony is different. This is genius. A lot of pieces in the game make use of ostinato in the bass, a common but effective technique at structuring a bass line. In certain pieces, it also has the added effect of emphasizing the changing melody above. I take a look at the music for Spoon's Island, a place filled with ancient history which features some heavy puzzle solving. As you advance deeper in the island, more melodic layers are added which bring out new harmonies and new places of contention. For example, the sustained G in the flute here creates dissonance with the fleeting A flat in the guitar. But further along in the island, the piano that comes in borrows from the flute's melody, and now there is a sustained G and F and the A flat. And it's subtle too, not jarring, and just enough to catch the listener's attention. We saw on the title screen theme, this piece also makes heavy use of empty space, having these plucky instruments placed close to the mic to really tear through those silent gaps. And as I mentioned, this is an adaptive track that changes as you progress to the island, but what's important is how it adapts. It doesn't just add more instruments, but creates new sounds and feelings with just enough variation on the bass line to not transform the song entirely. Oh, and Quick thing, I'm pretty sure this piece is a nod to the OG Legend of Zelda dungeon theme. The ostinato in the bass line sounds fairly similar, and the puzzle solving aspects of the island lend to this as well. I'd be curious to know if that's what was actually going through the composer's head at the time.
The last topic I want to cover are some of the ways the game uses asymmetric rhythm to make melodies unique and catching to the ear. Things like unusual time signatures and syncopation create a kind of rhythmic dissonance, which in the hands of an experienced composer can create some very memorable pieces. The Dessert Mountain track is a phenomenal example of this, with its bonkers 5-4 time signature and some of the most fast-paced music in the whole game. is strong and fairly straightforward, the syncopation created by the guitar, the first and the second piano is almost disorienting. Again, there is that tension in the music that immediately captures the player's focus. And like in Spoons Island, we'll see more instrumentation gradually added to the simple bass line as we ascend the mountain. In my opinion, the most dramatic portion of the song is here in these few bars. At first, the piano and the flute contest one another for where the strong beat lies. But then, when we're expecting a simple repetition of the previous bars, there is instead this sudden crescendo and a forcible ascension into a C major chord. the time signature change, which shaves off a 16th note from our measure and gives these bars a frantic quality. Each one seems to lean into the next, and again, this disruption keys the listener back into the music and adds so much power and presence to this piece. stop here now because I could literally go on for hours dissecting each and every piece of music from this game. They are all just that brilliant. Looping this back to our discussion on musical presence, we saw how interesting progressions, good use of lead motifs, and adaptive sound all contribute to this idea of musical presence. The dissonance in rhythmic complexity when used subtlety also lend to a strong sense of interest and work to catch the listener's attention. Recording close to the mic and the use of long silences pull the music close to the listener and make each new note surprising. And we didn't talk about this much, but simply a unique and catchy melody can do so much to give a piece a strong presence. Now that simple 12 note motif used in the song Abandon Me always gives me chills. The idea of musical presence is so important because without it, music just becomes another asset of video games to be enjoyed separately from the story and gameplay. Worse is when you don't even notice the music and it just becomes a part of the background, like all the textures and shading and minute visual details. And like I said earlier, the game soundtracks we find near and dear are those that catch our attention and take us out of the gameplay, making us considering the music as something more than just a background track. This day and age, we are absolutely inundated with music everywhere we go, and I feel it's lost some of its special meaning because of this. But that's why games like Chicory, A Colorful Tale are so important to remind us that music can have meaning and presence. <laughs>